Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation about photography and photographs at the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Centre during Archives Awareness Week 2021. My name is Deb Sturdevant. I'm the archivist here and joining me today is Krista Keller, one of our archival assistants. Part of Krista's education includes a Master of Arts degree in Photographic Preservation and Collections Management. So she has kindly agreed to take the lead in sharing information with us throughout the presentation. So over the next approximately 45 to 50 minutes, we will discuss aspects of the history of photography and along the way we'll be showcasing items from our photography holdings and highlighting some of the ways that they help tell Bruce County's story. We'll also talk about how we care for and preserve the photographs in our collection and how you may view them in person or online. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in the comments box and we'll plan to answer them at the end of the presentation. We'd like to thank our sponsor, the Bruce County Historical Society, for supporting the promotion of the archives and this presentation. They've been a consistent supporter of Archives Awareness Week over the years, and you'll enjoy having a look at their website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel for more resources and activities related to Bruce County history. Finally, before we begin the photography discussion, I have a brief introduction to the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Center. We've been collecting, preserving, and facilitating access to Bruce County's history since 1955. Archival paper documents and photographs have been accepted since the very beginning. However, in 1979, the archives was established as a more formal part of the museum through the initiative of the Bruce County Historical Society. The archival collection holds information related to a wide range of topics. We accept donations from individuals, organizations, and businesses, uh, and these items include um, material such as letters, diaries, minutes, financial records, posters, family histories, videos, and of course, photographs. The archives also holds government records for both the county level and municipalities. These records may be accessed by anyone with an interest in history and wishing to learn more about those who came before us and the development of our communities. So with that, I'll pass it over to Krista to introduce us to the development of photography. Thank you, Deb, for that introduction. And so we'll now start talking about photographs. Um, so photography has been around for the last 180 years, which is a relatively short amount of time, given how much this medium has changed. So since its invention, photography has embraced countless of different methods, processes, and formats driven by the goal of making each new process easier, faster, and cheaper. Within the medium's first 100 years, photography went from being an innovation only a few could practice or afford to a product that was mass-produced and accessible to almost everyone. And though we would love to discuss the entire reach of photography, it would be impossible with the time constraints of this presentation to focus and highlight on the the methods and formats and techniques that are represented in the Bruce County Archival Collection. So photography has generally been accepted to have been, have been invented by Joseph Nesiphore Niepce and Louis Daguerre with the creation of the daguerreotype. So prior to this, several in individuals across the globe were experimenting with light sensitive materials and chemicals, um, and these gen individuals generally had success creating photographic images, however these images were latent or fleeting. So the challenge was to not only produce an image, but for that image to remain permanent. This all changed on January 7th, 1839, with, when the French government announced the first complete photographic process called daguerreotype. So these are made on highly polished silver-coated copper plates and developed with mercury vapors. And though it was quite a laborious process, anyone with the means could acquire the full instructions to create and sell their own daguerreotypes. So unfortunately, we don't have any daguerreotypes in our collection. Um, so we're using a few images from the Library of Congress's collection just to give you an idea of what they look like in case you come across one in your own collection or at an antique fair and so on. So identifying daguerreotype, daguerreotypes are actually quite easy um, because they're made from silver. They appear shiny and almost appear mirror-like and they usually depict portraits and are typically found cased. 
So daguerreotype photographs were actually relatively expensive at the time and accessible only to the middle and upper classes. And this could be a reason why we don't have any in our collection here at the Bruce County Archives, though um, daguerreotypes did eventually lose popularity in the mid 1850s due to the invention of a new and less expensive technique called collodion or wet collodion. So collodion is a process that was used in the making of ambrotypes, tintypes, and glass plate negatives, as well as printing out papers. Collodion is a viscous substance containing chemicals, which was then hand poured over a plate in a thin layer. In ambrotypes, which we'll be discussing first, the plate was a piece of clear glass. So once the collodion uh, coated plate was light sensitive, the plate was then loaded into the camera, exposed and developed, all still well wet. So since these photographs had to be processed just before the collodion dried, the plate had to be prepared just prior to being exposed and a dark room needed to be nearby, um, again, to develop the plate immediately after. Development times uh, did vary, and this was all done by the eye of the photographer. At the time, collodion could be purchased as it was uh, quite dangerous to make, but the plates had to be prepared by the photographer um, on site. So the collodion process was produ produced uh, generally an opaque, light, milky colored negative image. And because ambrotypes were made on clear glass plate, a piece of dark fabric or paint needed to be applied to the back of the image for that negative image to appear positive. So if you made ambrotypes today, you could simply just use a dark piece of glass and this would automatically create that dark, that direct positive. In this example here of a portrait of an unknown child, you can see the trademark milky colored um, collodion in the highlights while there's little to no collodion here in the dark areas and so that's why the dark backing is needed. So like daguerreotypes, ambrotypes are also usually found cased and this would help keep the dark backing in place and it also prevents damage to the image and reduces the chances of the glass plate from being from breaking. In this example, you can see that the ambrotype is housed in a hinge case, and this was very common in North America. We can see that there's a green velvet cushion here on the left, and on the right side is the photograph. So on top of the actual ambrotype, there's another piece of protectant glass, and we can also see that there's a decorative oval overmat here. So overmats would come in different shapes and sizes, as well as different levels of ornamentation. This one's quite ornate here. And then we can finally see around the overmat, there's a, um, uh, around the perimeter, this would be the metal preserver. So the preserver helped keep the overmat, the protectant glass, as well as the ambrotype securely in its case. The case right here is a union case, which we can tell because it's made from thermoplastic. Um, cases also could be made from compressed paper or leather colored, sorry, leather covered wood. And the style of the casing varied from very simple to a lot of ornamentation. But overall, cases provided opportunities for customization and ornamentation early photographs, as well as more practical reasons for keeping the photographs safe. So the collodion process evolved slightly to produce an even cheaper type of photograph called the tintype. So unlike the name suggests, tintypes are actually made on thin pieces of lacquered or enameled iron and not tin. When the collodion is developed on the iron plate, it appears as a direct positive due to the dark background, thus eliminating the need for a fabric or painted background, which ambrotypes did require. At the time, glass was more expensive than iron, so the tintype became a much more affordable option, and for the first time, lower classes could afford photography. So this was a significant shift in the world of photography, and as a result, tintypes became incredibly popular in North America, particularly throughout the 1860s and 1870s. So in addition to the regular photography studios, traveling photographers offering tintypes became regular fixtures at uh, fairs and street corners. And because photographers needed to have that chemistry on hand and beside them, many traveled in wagons that doubled as dark rooms. So tintypes are much more durable, um, especially later on when it was common to apply a thin layer of varnish on the surface. So we'll find them on their own, like in the photographs we see on the right. We'll also still find them in cases, which we can see here. As well, we'll find them in paper sleeves, we can see in the top left corner. So since some of the tintypes at the Bruce County Archives are not cased, we can gain a little bit of insight into how they were made. So because plates were hand dry or hand poured, you can sometimes see pore lines um, on the plate, which would sh either showcase in an uneven surface or parts of the plate having no image because the clothing did not reach the edge of the plate. 
In the tin type here in the bottom right, we can see that there's actually a buildup of collodion here in the bottom right corner. And this is another indicator um, of, of pore line. And this is would tell me that the photographer poured off the excess collodion from this plate in that particular corner. Also, since tintypes had to be handled while wet, we'll also sometimes see, you'll sometimes see the photographer's thumb, uh, fingerprints in the collodion, just because that's, you, and then you can tell that's where they held it. And so it's sort of ingrained in this photograph, as, same as the image. Um, you might be able to see these indicators in ambrotypes, but the, since it's cased, it would always hide um, sort of those trademarks. Uh, tintypes are also relatively easy to identify if they're not cased because it's the only photograph that's made of metal and usually the bare metal is visible on the back. They're also susceptible to rust, which we can see here at the top right corner. So this part is rusted and that part is rusted, um, which is a telltale sign that it is a tintype. Um, furthermore, other visual indicators of tintypes include the bending or denting of iron, like we can see in this plate here. We can see that it's quite warped and there's a lot of denting in the image area here. Uh, tintypes also typically have angled or uneven edges or one of the corners cut off, which we can see in this example. And this would have been done um, by the photographer. It was, uh, he would have trimmed, they would have trimmed the photograph after it was done. Uh, the, particularly the corners to make it easier to put into cases or envelopes or the paper sleeves that we saw in the previous slide. This tintype here is also unusual for our collection because it's a full plate tintype. Um, other tintypes in our collection are quarter plates, six plates, or ninth plates. So put, to put that in perspective, a quarter, six, or a ninth of the size of this one. It's also been tinted quite heavily. And so though tinting was not uncommon and was used from the daguerreotype, and we actually see tinting here in the rosy cheeks of this woman, this one was actually tinted all over and we can see that colored paint was actually applied quite heavily to the entire photograph. So where it gets tricky to identify ambrotypes um, and tintypes um, is when they're cased. So both of them, when they're in really great condition, when they're cased, they're virtually indistinguishable. However, if you simply place a magnet on the glass front of the case and the magnet sticks, then we know that the plate is magnetic and would be a tintype. If it were to fall off, then we know that's an ambrotype. So I also want to note that from the last few slides, it's clear that we have several tintypes in our collection. So we reflect on the number of tintypes we have compared to the amount of daguerreotypes and ambrotypes in our collection. It is truly a reflection of how accessible photography was at the time. So though there may be several reasons why a photograph may not have survived, but like it's similar to most material objects that there is a correlation between how financially accessible photographs were and how many of them are produced. And this has definitely represented the archives. In addition, we also see a lot more variation um, and creativity in the uses of tintypes, um, which you can see in the photograph here, which was taken on the bias. So that's quite unique, as well as the photographs that were taken and trimmed to fit in this lock in these lockets here. So daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and tintypes produce one-of-a-kind image. So if you wanted a few photographs to take home with you, the photographer would have had to prepare multiple plates and then take them all in separate shots. In 1841, so just two years after the daguerreotype was announced, Henry Fox Talbot from England invented the calotype process, which was the first negative positive technique using paper, salt, silver, and wax to create paper negatives, and thus the ability to create multiple prints from the same image. Talbot's calotype process was eventually uh, replaced by Gustave Le Gray's wax paper negatives, but bo uh, and both processes were actually much more popular in France and the United Kingdom than in North America. And that's why we see ambrotypes and tintypes in our collection here uh, at, in the Bruce County instead of paper negative prints. So though these two processes were not popular here, the development of the negative positive process became the foundation for many superseding formats that we'll talk about throughout this presentation. So in the mid 1800s, the collodion process uh, was adapted yet again and used for making wet collodion negatives. So typical with collodion, the negatives had a creamy looking emulsion layer and had to be made just before being exposed and developed immediately after. These negatives were also susceptible to these pore lines, which sometimes resulted in an uneven collodion layer or the collodion not reaching the edge of the negative. Wet collodion negatives were eventually succeeded by the dry plate gelatin negative. Um, gelatin uh, dry plate negatives consist of silver suspended in a gelatin binder, which was then applied to a glass support. 
the introduction of the dry plate negative was a significant leap forward in the world of photography because dry plates could be made in advance and they could be stored rather than being made on the spot. They also became one of the first photographic products that should be manufactured and mass produced by multiple companies, including Eastman Kodak. So negatives evolved from something that had to be prepared and developed on site to a product that could be purchased, ready made and used at the convenience of the photographer. So dry plates were so much easier and quicker to use that it actually sparked an increase in the number of amateur photographers. And during the late, late 1800s, gelatin dry plates were used almost exclusively for printing. So common characteristics for identifying gelatin dry plate negatives include an emulsion layer that's even and runs to the edge of the support. These negatives generally have a neutral gray to black image tones, and also they're susceptible to silver mirroring. So we can see the silver mirroring along the right edge as well as the bottom edge of the image that's in the top left corner. And then also furthermore, because it's a glass support, it does have the, uh, the unfortunate uh, result of being able, like being cracking or breaking, which we can see in this negative here. So the museum has a large collection of over 1,300 glass plate negatives taken by King Carden, banker, town clerk, and amateur photographer John H. Skugel. So you can see him pictured here in this image, and he was a public spirited citizen who took an active interest in the activities of King Carden, and his photographs reflect the people, places, and businesses, um, and the activities of the town and the area surrounding it. So these negatives have provided the archives and our researchers with such a wealth of information and we have scanned each quality image and you can search the digital scans as well as their descriptions on our online collection site. And it's often, I often wonder that maybe the ease of the new dry plate negative being so easy and quick to use inspired Google to take up photography as a hobby. So now we know sort of how negatives were made, we can also now start talking about the photographic processes and techniques that were used to create photographic prints. So prints made by wax paper as well as glass uh, support negatives were made using the contact print method. And this meant that the negative was placed directly on the synthesized paper and exposed this way so it would obtain the most amount of detail. This also generally meant that the size of your negative was the size of your print. One of the uh, most common types of uh, photographic prints made from about the 1850s until just before the turn of the century was albumin. So albumin prints were made by coating a thin piece of paper in egg whites and salts and then sensitized. Um, albumin prints were very popular and their scope of their use very greatly around this time. So in the center, for example, we can see the albumin being used in a stereograph card. Albumin prints generally have a smooth and shiny surface due to their egg white binder, and they also have a brown purplish coloring tones. In terms of deterioration, um, because of their organic and chemical makeup, albumin prints do tend to deteriorate, and this can be seen in the fading, as well as yellowing of the highlights, which we can see in most of these images here. Um, we can especially see the fading in the composite photograph here on the top right. And they also sometimes show silver mirroring. So that's when the silver rises to the surface of the image. Our next photographic process as we're at popular this time was collodion printing out papers. So again, collodion um, shows its face again. Um, and these were also used uh, for making prints in the late 1800s. Collodion prints have a glossy surface sheen and are reddish uh, brown to purple brown tonal range. They also, unlike albumin, they sh almost show no fading and no silver mirroring, which definitely helps distinguish them from albumin prints. They're also generally found mounted uh, because of the thin paper support would tend to curl if it wasn't mounted. And then finally, uh, the, we see gelatin printing out papers. Uh, so these eventually outsold collodion printing out papers in the 1890s. Uh, key identifying features of gelatin printing out Prints include reddish brown to purple brown tones, as well as a glossy surface. So like albumin, they also experience some fading, which is most noticeable in the highlights. So we can see in this image at the top here that there's quite a bit of fading um, in the shoreline, as well as the, the light outfits that the people are wearing. And it also shows some discoloring, discoloration, as well as some yellowing, which we can see in the bottom left photograph here. However, in very good condition, these prints can 
be quite difficult to distinguish from collodion printing out papers. So during the mid 1800s, one of the most uses, common uses of albumin, collodion and gelatin printing out papers was the carte de visite and cabinet card. So carte de visites are small standard size photographs, generally portraits adhered to a piece of cardstock. They were invented in 1854 when a process to capture eight different exposures from one glass negative was invented. So this process actually cut down costs considerably, and as a result, uh, carte de became very popular. Carte de were typically used as calling cards and were commonly traded and collected with friends, family, or left behind after a house visit. So collecting photographs of royalty, including Queen Victoria and Napoleon III, actually spearhead the popularity of the carte de visite. It was the first time much of the population could see or even own an image of the reigning royalty. Owning mass-produced images of the royalty now is considered old hat, but this was really a practice that was revolutionized by the carte de visite. Um, in the archives here, we have a few carte de visites, like in this example here, and it is fun to think about how much these items were once really prized possessions, as well as the, the various rituals and practices that, was, that were born out of this process. So in the late eight, in the 1880s, the carte de visites were actually eventually superseded by the cabinet card, um, which are essentially the same as a carte de visite, just in larger format. Um, because both uh, were mounted on cardstock, photographers had the opportunity to design the bottom and back of the cardstock however they wanted. In this example here, we can see the photographer added their name as well as the location where their city, um, the location where their studio was at the bottom of the carte de visite. Um, and we have many cabinet cards and carte de visites with really ornate and visually appealing designs on them, which we'll show in this slide here. Um, so here are a few examples um, of some of the carte de visites and cabinet cards from our collection. So I wanna highlight this example here on the right. It's a scan from a page of a photographic album in our collection. So at this time, photographic albums with slots um, as well as windows meant for cabinet cards and, car and carte de visites were actually produced. So this is a cabinet card and we can see that this window opening here was made specifically to put this photograph in as well as the slot at the bottom, which would allow the user or owner to slide the photograph in. In this cabinet card, we also see uh, Mary Stuart Boyle holding a carte de visite, um, which is pretty neat. And in the other examples, we see that the photographer um, designed the back as well as the bottom of the carte de visites and cabinet cards um, in a really ornate and really cool way. We can also see a little bit more customization in this cabinet card here on the left with some beveled edging, which we can see on all four sides. So I think it's really easy to romanticize uh, photographs and the subjects within them, but it's also important to understand that photography was generally a commercial venture with the goal of making it easier, faster, and cheaper. So as a result, we tend to see a lot of the same practices and techniques over again. And obviously, we can tell from this presentation that photography was used a lot for portraiture, and we have many portraits here at the Bruce County Archives and do continue to accept them as donations today. These portraits illustrate the individuals and families that have formed and shaped Bruce County over the years. And I think although sometimes portraits can look quite basic, you can actually glean a lot of information about how they are made. And I want to take a few slides to talk about a few techniques that photographers use to create their portraits. And maybe you'll be able to spot these in your own photography collections and in the examples we'll show you throughout the rest of the presentation. So the one the most obvious things that you'll notice probably in these examples is that no one is smiling. And I think a lot of people may chalk it up as the past of being a more serious culture than it is now. And perhaps it was, but in portraits, this was more of a practical reason. Exposure times range from a handful of seconds to up to a minute, depending on how bright the sun was. And holding a smile for that long of a time without your lips sort of moving or quivering is practically impossible. So to avoid having a blurry mouth in the finished product, it was easier just not to smile. And this is why we typically don't see anyone smiling in portraits. Furthermore, in the portraits here on the right, these were both vignetted just in two different ways. So, so the portrait on the top, this was vignetted um, during the time that the print was made. So the photographer would have used a template um, that had a window opening in an oval shape, which would have prevented the photograph the paper from being exposed here on the borders and just singling this in this oval here. 
in this example here on the bottom, the, this would have been vignetted at the time the negative was taken. So what the photographer would have done was was to place a piece of curved cardstock or even a piece of fabric close to the camera so that this would be out of focus while the subject would remain in focus. And that's where you get this sort of gradation or ombre effect in this photograph. There's also quite a bit of manipulation um, in terms of either prints or negatives. So this we can see in this portrait here of the Inglis sisters that only five of them were actually there um, during the time that this negative was taken. And the sixth Inglis sister, which we can see here, was actually added in after. So this um, her bust portrait is actually a print that was cut out and then glued to this picture, but to make it appear as though she was actually present during the time that this photograph was taken. Um, in these portraits, you'll notice that there's something behind the person's feet, which I can highlight in a few of these here. And these are the feet of opposing from the posing stand. So posing stands, um, also called headrests, were you were devices that would hold a certain body part still for the duration of the exposure. So the most common types were either for your arm to rest in or for the head to be secured in. Um, so you don't uh, do you don't move during the exposure. And we typically don't see the headrest too much or the feet from the headrest too much with portraits of women as the skirt of the dress was a really good way to hide it. So that's why we're highlighting an example, some portraits of men. Um, another thing to look at is if we look at the poses, we can also see that they're all quite very similar. So resting your hand on something or even sitting in a chair just gave a little bit more movement and dimension to a subject, but it also provided a practical place for the hand to rest on so it, it wouldn't move. And, it and so we can see in these examples that the tables or the chairs actually replace the need for a quite cumbersome and not so pretty um, armrest with a more visual pleasing object. So posing stands worked really well for older kids and adults, but keeping toddlers and babies still during the exposure was a different kind of challenge. And so here are a few examples of some children's portraitures from our collection. In the one, the example on the left, we can see that the child actually moved during the exposure of the negative, and that's why her their face is blurry during this, uh, in this photograph, sorry. In the, and we can see in the other two photographs, if we look beyond the subject, so beyond the baby and the toddler, we can see that they had additional help from their, their parents staying still. So in this tintype here, we can actually see that the parent was holding the toddler still for the duration of the exposure, but was covered up by a blanket. Um, so it looked like it was blending into the background. And the photographer even went so far as scraping off the collodion at the top of this photograph here, again, to make it blend more into the background and to move any sort of recognition that there was a parent holding the baby. In this example in the right, we can see that there's an arm coming out of the left-hand side. So again, the parent was holding the toddler still for the, the duration of the exposure. And we can see here that there was a little bit of negative man manipulation. So again, blurring the parent's face. So again, as if the parent would blend more into the background. So what we discussed were just a few of the techniques used in portraiture during this time. Um, there was definitely more, including tinting, uh, use of backgrounds and various props, negative retouching and enhancements with charcoal paint and so on. Um, but maybe now you'll be able to spot a few of these or all of them in the photographs and portraits of your family. So we're gonna shift back in time a little bit uh, to, to discuss, discuss prints as well as uh, the cyanotype. So cyanotypes were actually invented back in 1842 by Sir John Herschel. And the, it's actually a very easy and low cost photographic process, which requires minimal equipment and chemicals to create a light sensitive surface. And then the image was then simply developed and fixed with just water. So I think because of this reason, cyanotypes never really gained a professional professional status, and they were typically used for proofing negatives as they were quick and they were cheaper to use than other printing out papers at this time. Another very common use for photographs, for these photographs, were for engineering drawings, also known as blueprints. So cyanotypes are very easily distinguishable by their blue or cyan color. Um, Fun fact, they also have an interesting capability regenerating themselves. So for example, if you left a cyanotype in the sun and it started to fade, you could then place the photograph in a dark place and the image would regenerate to most or all of its former glory. We have about 26 cyanotypes in our collection. Um, and the examples here could have been proofs um, for, you know, that went on to, with 
to be prints of, with other photographic papers. However, we're so happy to have them in our collection because they're actually showing interior scenes of this t the tannery in Southampton. And interior scenes were somewhat unique for this time. So one of the most common kinds of black and white prints produced in the 1900s was the gelatin silver developing out prints. So these are different from the printing out papers that we discussed a few slides back. Um, developing out papers were first invented and went on to dominate the 20th century. And what dominates these from the previous papers we talked about was that they use chemicals rather than the sun as the main developing agent. So these were much more light sensitive than printing out papers. And so they only needed a few seconds for developing and could generally be bought ready made. Um, and they were also extremely easy to use and are relatively stable. So paper gelatin uh, developing out papers ranged um, in terms of surface sheens, textures and thickness and later became resin coated. Uh, these prints naturally have very neutral gray black tones, but can be toned to change their color into like warmer brown tones or even blue tones. So there's a lot of sort of customization with these. In terms of deterioration, they also are susceptible to yellowing as well as silver mirroring. However, you can find gelatin silver developing out papers used in almost everything throughout the 20th century. They were extremely popular, and I'm sure you've seen them used in postcards, identification documents like passports or advertisements or panoramic, panoramic photographs like the one we see here, in portraits, art photography, and so on. So really their reach went so far. And we, as a result, we have thousands of gelatin prints in the archives, and these photographs have been such a wealth of information, uh, whether it's a postcard of Tobamori or the Flower Pot Islands or a street scene of Walkerton or a wedding photograph from a, like, a couple of Formosa. Um, our researchers and the staff here at the archives have learned so much about the history of Bruce County from these photographs. So as mentioned previously, uh, the Eastman Kodak Company uh, started to mass produce gelatin dry plate negatives and they garnered much commercial success doing so. In 1900, however, the Eastman Kodak Company, which were who were already known for their user-friendly cameras and products, revolutionized the world of photography with the invention of their brownie camera. So the brownie camera was only sold for a dollar at this time, so it was pretty much financially accessible to almost everyone. And for the first time, it meant that anyone could be a photographer. So people could own cameras, take their images, um, and this essentially marked the birth of vernacular photography and the birth of what we know is the snapshot. So the Eastman Kodak uh, company released the slogan, you press the button and we do the rest, and the brownie camera really delivered on the slogan. Once the individual took all their exposures, the whole camera could be sent in for processing and returned with the prints, negatives, and then the reloaded camera. So it's really important to, to sort of emphasize like how the world of photography changed with this one camera. One of the differentiation differentiating features about the negatives in the Brownie camera was that they were on a flexible transfilm transparent film base uh, and not glass supports. So flexible film bases were first marketed in 1891 and used in a few cameras prior to the Brownie. Um, flexible film became very popular with amateur photographers because it was easy to use um, and light, but professionals, uh, photographers still relied on glass plate negatives, um, which captured greater amounts of details. So glass plate negatives were eventually uh, used until the arrival of sheet film, which we can see pictured here, um, which happened in the mid 1920s. So sheet films are large format negatives on individual flexible bases instead of a roll. And the most common we size we see in the archives is four by five inches. However, they can also came in larger and smaller sizes. And like gelatin dry plate negatives, sheet films hold a lot of information and they're much easier and less cumbersome to use than the glass plate negatives. Uh, many companies, including Ilford, Fuji, as well as Kodak, sold sheet film, and some of them continue to sell it today. And the film can usually be identified by and dated by their unique notch codes along the top of the edge, or sometimes they're stamped with the company's name. Um, roll film, however, um, since its introduction has also evolved and progressed so much to the 20th century. And as a result, we see countless of different sizes and shapes of roll films here at the archives. Um, probably one of the most recognizable to most of our researchers is the 35 millimeter negative.
We do have a large collection of over 22,000 negative images taken by brothers Howard and Bruce Krug, who were most notably Chesley furniture manufacturers, conservationists, and historians. The collection contains 35 millimeter negatives of people, places, and businesses in Bruce County, as well as the surrounding areas. From the 1920s, uh, they, took these, sorry, they took these photographs from about the 1920s all the way up to the 2000s. So we currently have over 6,700 of these images viewable online, but staff and volunteers are working their way to digitize and upload the remainder of the thousands of wonderful and important images. We also have a large collection of over 20,000 negatives captured by teacher and photographer J. Lindsay Thornburn from 1950 to 1983. Uh, he photographed sports teams, schools, events, and organizations within the town of Port Elgin. And within the Thornburn collection, we also see the evolution from black and white photography uh, to color photography. So color, um, once again, was a significant leap in the world of photography. Um, in 1839, Kodak released Kodachrome, which created 35 millimeter slides, as well as eight millimeter and 16 millimeter motion picture film. But in 1942, Kodacolor was released as the first true uh, negative film for still photography. So the chromogenic process was the easiest, fastest, and cheapest form of color photography and was used to create prints, negatives, and transparencies. Um, transparencies were also used for slides. And it became the dominant color process throughout the 20th century. And again, we see the evolution of different and several different shapes and sizes of chromogenic prints, negatives, and transparencies within our collection. Common signs of deterioration with chromogenic prints include the yellowing of highlights, which we can see in this bottom photograph here, as well as the yellowing of borders, um, which we can see here, as well as the shifting and fading of the colors due to poor dye stability. Um, we, I'm showing you examples of prints, which are these examples here, as well as the reverse of a coda chrome uh, print here, which is the back stamp, as well as this is an example of one of the color slides we have in our collection. So in 1863, instant dye diffusion transfers, or also called instant color photography or peel apart color film was introduced, which was then followed by internal dye diffusion transfers in 1902. So the latter internal dye diffusion transfer prints are all better known as Polaroids. The chemistry in both instant color photographs is very complicated, but essentially chemicals needed to develop, stop, and fix a photograph are contained with or came with the photograph and were created to be entirely self-timing. Self with instant dye diffusion transfers, so though it was an instant photograph, the user still needed to separate the print from their negative and its chemical components. The Polaroid, however, was truly a one-step process, and all you needed was to click the button and a little patience for that image um, to, to appear. To identify instant dye diffusion transfer prints, you'll usually see the remnants or adhesive of adhesive markings along the white borders where the user had to peel apart the film. And there's usually like brand back prints from the company with Polaroids, so internal dye diffusion. You also see that signature white plastic frame that Polaroids have, as well as the company's back printing on the reverse of the image. So with all that rich history behind us, we're now in the world of digital photography. And it was actually the Kodak company who released the first digital camera in 1975. It was quite a cumbersome camera, but it was the start of the latest photographic process that's even still evolving to this day. So digital prints, um, which we see, include electrophotography which, or photocopies, uh, Xerox. Um, we also see inkjet, inkjet, or more sort of professional name is Jigli. And then we also see thermal prints. And I'm sure most of us are very familiar with thermal prints as those is what we receive when we um, print them from those kiosks that we see at various stores. So point and shoot digital cameras and digital photography have sort of ingrained themselves into our culture. We're taking printing 
we're taking printing and sharing images like never seen before, similar to the past phenomena and practices that came with tin types or the sharing of carte de visite and cabinet cards or the ease of dry plate negatives and color photography. And so due to the ease and low cost of digital photography, the world is now saturated with images of snapshots, uh, portraits, social media posts, like in this example here, and advertisements to name a few. So like any type of photograph, the Archives accepts digital donations, which Deb will talk about next. Thank you, Krista. We accept donations of prints and born digital images at the Archives. Recently, we have been accepting digital images, particularly in relation to our Chronicling Community Experiences COVID-19 collection initiative. We're accepting uh, photographs, video, and written stories in relation to our experiences during the pandemic. So it's our hope that these materials will help future Bruce County residents better appreciate and really understand what our communities looked like and felt like during the time. For more information about that initiative and ways that you can make a donation, visit the museum website, brucemuseum.ca and forward slash share your story. To finish off our presentation, we'd like to discuss a few ways that we care for our photographs at the archives. As Krista mentioned, each type of photographic process has its own unique chemical makeup, which leads to different types of deterioration. Some photographic materials are more stable than others. Think about some of the color prints you have. Are some of them yellowed or have their colors shifted? Are your black and whites suffering from fading or silver mirroring? One of the steps we take to slow deterioration is to store all our photographs in a temperature and humidity controlled room. So the temperature is a bit cooler than the average room temperature and the humidity remains consistent year round. We also store them in acid free boxes and in acid free paper files. So the photos are not touching one another uh, or other material that could trigger a chemical deterioration. For oversized photos, we store them in flat, either in boxes or on metal stable shelving units, also separated by paper or tissue. The boxes and shelves help prevent dust and light from reaching the photograph, and we also have blocking filters on the windows to block harmful light rays. I know some people have their storage areas in their basements or their attics, and these places can be more humid, especially in the summer months. And then of course they wanna protect them from leaks, so they put them in bags. And this environment is an ideal haven for mold growth, and it can also hasten deterioration. So uh, chemicals, particularly for negatives, they can off gas when you seal them in a bag, and those gases accumulate and can be a catalyst for further deterioration. Um, so handling photographs is one uh, also a common way uh, to damage them. So one of the things we do to mitigate the risk posed by frequent handling is to scan the photographs. The digital copy may then meet the researcher's needs without frequent handling of the original. Of course, we do have the originals available for people who need to look at them for their research. For archival reasons, we scan photographic prints at 600 dpi in TIFF format and negatives at 2000 dpi. And that's a lossless format, so it gives us a good master file from which to make smaller JPEG derivative copies as needed. Another way to reduce the risk of handling is to store photographs in mylar sleeves, as you can see with our negatives here. That means we can look at the front and reverse of a photograph or negative without touching the image surface. And Mylar is basically a brand name for an archival polyester film that is chemically inert, so it won't discolor itself and it will not damage the items that are housed in it. When we do need to view a photograph we, uh, and touch it, we wear cotton or nitrile gloves, which prevent the oils from our fingers from damaging the items. So now to access our collection, you may view over 22,000 of our images online through online collections. We upload to that site about every two weeks. Most of the photographic images are in the photo section, although you might find some postcards or images particularly related to other archi archival documents in the archive section as well. You may view the video about halfway down that page for tips on effective searching on the site. 
to view some of the specific collections that Krista has mentioned and to browse, say, the Skugel, Krug, or Thornburn collections, uh, you can visit our research information page. We have links that will lead you directly to um, the online collection sections that house those uh, images. If you're having difficulty locating an item online, you may speak to us about your research needs and or make an appointment to visit our research room at the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Centre in Southampton. Finally, we'd like to ask you how to consider how you can help tell Bruce County's story. Here at the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Centre, we accept donations of photographs depicting Bruce County events, places and people with identified context, uh, both historic and current. So please contact us by phone or email to discuss a possible donation if you have items that you'd like to consider contributing. We hope that you've enjoyed learning about some aspects of photographic history through the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Centre's archival collection. We will be posting this video to the museum's YouTube channel. And now we're going to copy these resource links as well into the comments section here on Facebook. As we're going to now move on to be open to answering your questions. Hello, so Krista and I are prepared to answer some questions now. Uh, we did have one question come in during the presentation. Uh, Denise, thank you. Uh, she posed a question when Krista was discussing glass plate negatives, asking how can you view the glass plate negatives? So um, you can come into the research room and if you wish to look at the actual physical glass plate. Um, so right now, uh, being April 2021, we are closed to the public due to the provincial order. Um, however, when we reopen, uh, you can just check our, our website here over on the right uh, where there's the little yellow clock that will give you our hours. And particularly during uh, pandemic times, if you go to the About Us uh, area down to archives and research room tips for visiting. You'll see a little bit more about um, the need to make appointments and how to do that. So if you make an appointment to come and visit us and tell us you'd like to see uh, the glass plate negatives, we would be happy to bring some out for you to view. Um, uh, just to carry on from that for a quick minute, for those of you who would like to see the images of Skugel, I can show you a little bit more here on that research information page, which is from the research dropdown. Um, you just click on the photograph collection here and we have links directly to the Skugel collection there. Um, so you can see you have a list of uh, 1,348 that come up here. And uh, when you click on each one, you can view them uh, in a larger way. So I see there's some other questions coming in here. Um, Dorn's asked if it's our intent to upload all the images to our website. Um, thank you, Dorn. Uh, yes, uh, eventually all the images uh, that are in the public domain or for which we do not have donor restrictions, uh, the ultimate goal is to have those uh, accessible online to individuals. So we are working towards that now. Um, we have a yeah another question uh, from Eva, and she asked if it was possible to purchase copies of some of these old photographs from the museum. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, on our uh, main museum page there, you can see under research, there is a photo request form. So you can click on that and uh, what we need when you do that, um, there is a fee, there are high resolution digital images that you're available to purchase. Um, and we need the uh, this A number that you'll be looking for. So each uh, image is identified um, by an object identification number. And while I'm on this screen, I'll just show you too, when you do see um, a thumbnail, quite often, especially for the Krug and Thornburn collections, there will be multiple images attached to that record. So when I open this one, for example, you'll see there's actually all 36 images from that negative rule um, on that item. 
And uh, when you open them larger and you mouse over it, you'll see the arrows that makes it easier to scroll through. Uh, go ahead, Krista. Yeah. Uh, so a question from Robin came in and he asked, how did the photographer prepare a plate on the spot without exposing it? So it's a really great question. Uh, so what they did is they would have ex uh, prepared the plate within like a, a dark room and then they would have put it in like a negative holder which would have been like in the capsule to keep it from light entering it and then you would have inserted it in the camera and then pulled out the over like the front plate and so that was when it would get exposed and then you could put the front plate back in and then bring again that package back into the dark room so this would be for wet plate as well as dry plate and then also for the sheet film that we were talking about um yep, i see uh, that the question from denise there about her glass plate negatives so um yeah if you want to contact us privately we have a uh it's a i guess a light box that sometimes we can view uh negatives on um so we may be able to assist you with that depending how many you have that you wish to look at um so anyone who wants to ask a private or personal questions as well, uh, can give us a call um, after the presentation or email us at archives at uh, brucecounty.o. And thanks, Kent, for your um, comment there. Um, we do work with uh, some different organizations and Facebook pages to help provide them with images to help make them accessible to the community as well. Just give you a few more minutes if you have um, other questions. Uh, while I'm waiting, I will mention, particularly on the Thornburn collection, uh, I want to mention the send us feedback link. Um, if you see uh, an image that we have um, that we're missing identification for, or you feel we have something misidentified, um, please contact us. You can call us or email. Whoops, I'm getting a some feedback here, sorry. Um, you can click the uh, send us feedback link here and that opens a form and uh, that information then comes directly to archive staff and it's connected to the image uh, or the record that you were looking at. So that's very helpful to us and we've uh, a number of people have done that for us, able to update, update identification in these photographs. Um, we do tend to do uploads uh, to online collections about once every two weeks. Um, so uh, we always have new things being uploaded. Yeah, we just have a few other comments from Eva. Thank you again <laughs> for your great comment and as well as from Denise, another great comment. Um, if you're looking for uh, places to purchase uh, materials for your, your own family archives, such as the acid tree folders and some of the um, negative holders, the, the clear negative holders we were showing, um, you can always check with our local um, office supply stores. Some of them do carry acid-free materials. I've, we've purchased um, acid-free folders from Holst in Walkerton before, for example. Um, but then there's also some companies that are really specifically catering towards archival materials. So Car McLean um, is one of those where we get a lot of our items. And uh, Uline also provides some as well. So I can put some of those uh, in the comment box here. Uh, so, Deb, we have another question from Allison, and uh, they wrote, is the photo search function available at the archives the same as the online one available to all of us, or is it more detailed? Uh, so, the search function in online collections is the same. Um, of course, anytime you're having trouble like finding a particular image, um, please contact us because uh, we uh, only have a certain percentage of our items online so far. Uh, we do have 22,000 images online, um, but there's more that we are still processing. So each time we have uh, images digitized, you know, you can see we have a lot of information that we need to add to make them truly searchable and discoverable. Um, so in-house, we do have um, a database that's connected to this with more information information that staff can help you search. 
Uh, and um, of course, just from our knowledge of the collection, sometimes we can find things for you that aren't available online. Well, there doesn't seem to be too many more questions coming in. So i just like to thank everyone for joining us again. I think we'll wrap things up now. Um, we are going to be uploading this presentation to YouTube if you'd like to revisit it. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And as I said, if you have any other additional questions you'd like to ask, please give us a call or you can email us at uh, archives at brucecounty.on.ca.